Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Well, about a month ago, we began studying this last section of Paul's epistle to the, the Corinthians, his second epistle to the Corinthians. And I mentioned that this last section, um, again, the whole bu- book uh, topic being um, embracing afflictions, this last section from chapter 10 to chapter 13 is dealing with spiritual afflictions and, and how we, we, um, we deal with that. And we spent the last month then looking at part of this coming from the beginning of chapter 10 the, about concerning the weapons of our warfare and what those weapons are to be used for. And so last week in part of the message, I brought up this um, concept of Satan's twofold attack. And that is that he loves to attack the message and attack the messenger. Um, in just a little aside, another little illustration that in war, if you think about in war, the primary two first primary um, targets are going to be communication lines. And secondly, the supply line. Um, the communication line is the, is the key right off the bat is that we want to disorient the troops on the front lines by them not knowing um, what the plans are, whether the, even the, the um, headquarters even exists anymore. And so in my mind, I go all the way back to um, Desert Storm, where the, the Air Force and Navy uh, bombers flew over um, our front lines and, and blew up um, into Iraq and such. And the, then the second thing they did was they, they then took out supply lines. And so when we went to then attack, putting ourselves almost as Satan here, but as we then went to attack, the Republican army put up their white flags and they, 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 um, they gave in because they didn't know um, whether anything even existed anymore. They weren't getting their beans and bullets and they weren't having any conversation with headquarters. And so from all they knew, the war had already been lost. That's what happens in the spiritual, the spiritual realm as well. Satan loves to destroy getting the message through. And um, twofold attack, A, he wants to, to destroy the, the message itself. He loves to attack um, the message, which is the truth of God's word, because that ultimately, again, as Steve shared during the, the um, devotional for communion, it ultimately goes back to the glory, the reputation, the doxa of God that um, Satan wants to be that God. He wants to receive that worship and praise. And so he wants to then destroy, take away from God receiving any of it. And so that comes by then deceiving, distorting the truth of God's word. Well, if he can't distort the message itself, the next best thing is to stop the message from being proclaimed. And so the, the next target then is, the messenger himself. And so Paul in this, this portion is really defending his ministry to those who are attacking him. And there's blending together then the, the concept of, the, um, of defending the truth as well. But as we're going to play out over these next three weeks, Lord willing, we're going to look at these last four chapters from the perspective of Paul's defense of the ministry and um, that he's going to now come in and to defend his ministry itself. As you seek to share the truth of God's word and to seek to live according to its standards, you are going to find opposition. That's what Paul basically says in a nutshell. He brings back, if you would, these teachings of Jesus into our mind, where in Matthew 5, we're told, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I've dealt with um, people in the past um, who had this persecution complex, though. So this is kind of a warning on the other side as well. We can bring persecution on ourselves unjustly. Note what Jesus said when they say all kinds of evil against you falsely. The reality is that if you're not living a godly life, if you're not living according to the standards of Christ, and then you try to proclaim that you are um, 
quote unquote, if you would, a prophet of God or speaking on behalf of God, and people persecute you for that or make fun of you for that, that, that has nothing to do with the name of Jesus. It has everything to do with the fact that you're living a hypocritical life. But if we're living for Christ and if we're proclaiming his words, if his words are the salt of our words, then we will receive persecution. In Matthew 10, as Jesus was sending forth the disciples into the, the villages and cities of Israel, he said to them within the, in the midst of all this, he says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? So, there's going to be this battle that's going on in the spiritual realm. We're told that um, in Ephesians 6, when we talked about the fact of putting on the armor of God, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, uh, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. And so there is this war that's going on. And so one of the, the greatest things, one of the greatest tactics is re this reverse psychology game where um, Satan loves to accuse then the true workers of God as being then workers of Satan. And so Paul is fighting the same exact battle that's going on. So that they call Jesus, um, that he did these things by the power of Beelzebub, who is Satan. And so the same thing plays out then for those who serve him. And so Paul begins this whole thing in, in um, 2 Corinthians 10 with the standard of our ministry. As he then brings forth this defense of his ministry, and if you would, ministry as a whole, he then lays out this in the, the very first section, first part of it, how that, that, that plays out. And the first one is the standard of our ministry. And that standard of our ministry is the humility of Christ. Paul comes and he says right there in verse one, um, he says, um, I'm Paul myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence in lowly among you, that Paul said, look, I've come in humbleness because that is the standard, that is the testimony of Christ, that Christ himself, when he came to the earth, was the most meekest and mildest and gentleness of men. But we know that when Jesus went into the, into the temple, into his own home, he scourged. He, he pulled out and he, and, he, and he cleansed the temple with a scourging. So he had the opportunity Jesus revealed boldness as well, but throughout his ministry, we're told that he was meek and lowly. In fact, we're told in Matthew 11, verse 28 um, and 30, says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Peter tells us, as he's talking about Christ and being a servant, uh, that in, in his epistle, he says, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously. That while Jesus was on the earth, he lived in meekness and gentleness. The only time we see Jesus become bold is against the quote-unquote righteous, the self-righteous, those who are seeking to, to laud themselves and applaud themselves. That's what we see um, with Paul right here. This is what's getting, if you would, his goat. This is what is rallying him up at this moment, that there are those not only just that are condemning his ministry, but are lauding themselves and getting people to follow them and not Christ. That ultimately should be the goal of each of our ministry, is to get people to follow Jesus. We are to be like cities that are set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid, that others may observe our good works, and that they may glorify our Father who is in heaven. 
not ourselves, but to continually look to Christ alone. So the standard for our ministry, first of all, is the humility of Christ. But secondly, then we're told as well, it's the headship of Christ. This is an amazing thing here that where Paul then, he, he turns and he looks um, at them, to them, and he says to them, verse two, he says, but I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence that I intend to be bold against some who think of us as we walked according to the flesh. And then he goes on in verse seven, he says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced, and the word patho actually means to trust. If anyone is trusting in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. There's a challenge that Paul kind of shoots across the ball right off the bat, and he's going to come back to this in chapter 12 and chapter 13, this, this challenge about whether you really are Christ's. He says, so if anyone is not convinced, but trusting in himself that he is Christ, this is a, this is a battle. We were told in Romans chapter 10 that if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And so the, the, the debate is, do you know about God here? Do you just have intellectual assent? Or do you really intimately, gnosko, know God? Again, remember, that's what the whole battle over truth is all about. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants men to know him. And so, not just know about him, but to know him. And so, Paul kind of shoots this, this shot then across the bow, and he says, look, are, are you just trusting in yourself that you know him, or do you really, really know him? So, his headship, because there's the deal, that if you really have confidence, if you really have faith in Christ, then he is your head, and as your head, he will then be your authority. Well, that concept of authority plays out all the way from the beginning at the very end of Jesus's ministry when he gives the Great Commission. Um, we always read about the beginning it says, go therefore and make disciples, but that is all based upon the statement that Jesus makes in verse 18 of Matthew 28. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, exousia, the right, the privilege, the power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, or therefore, based upon that, go and make disciples. So the fact that we are to go and make disciples is based upon the fact that Christ has all authority, and he has then bestowed that authority upon us. I can't do anything, or I shouldn't do anything, apart from the authority that Christ has given me. We have our question and answer time at the end of the, 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 um, the message. Um, instead of necessarily just giving out the, um, the invitation for people to come, and I've been challenged many times over the years by different men in the ministry that aren't I worried about my authority being challenged? And I, I, my response is, I, I have no authority. And they just look at me like, huh? You know, because you're the pastor. You, you got to have this authority. Well, I don't have any authority in and of myself. Just being the pastor by itself doesn't give me the authority apart from the authority that comes from Christ. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's the only authority that I have. And so if I am teaching his word, his truth, then if someone challenges that teaching, they're actually challenging him, not me. But if I'm not teaching his word, his truth, then I deserve to be challenged. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Jesus gives through Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, gives us this hierarchy of headship. And he says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. In the Godhead itself, there is this hierarchy of authority, hierarchy of headship, that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That plays then out spiritually between the Godhead and man as well, because the head of man is Christ, then there's man, and then there's the woman. There is the, the concept of authority and headship is throughout society. Romans 13 says that we're supposed to submit unto the governing authorities. And so, hence, that's why we're meeting this way during the COVID time right now, because we're seeking to honor the governing authorities, as God has asked us to do. There are a lot of people who, who challenge this and, and think that we're wrong to do this, but there's a balance in this. They have not told us that we cannot speak of Jesus. They have not told us 
that we cannot meet together and proclaim Christ. I'm still allowed to witness and, and give testimony when I go out. And so we're trying to find this balance then of how to be able to come together, Hebrews chapter 10, but still honor the governing authorities <clears throat> as they have asked us to, to, to seek to be considerate of those who are around us. In the weeks ahead, we're going to start coming together again, but we're still going to seek to honor the governing authorities in trying to have some social distancing in the chapel. And then that'll be slowly brought together so that we can all come together again. So continue again to pray for David, Steve, and I as we continue to work this whole pattern out. We're hoping to all come together into the field in the beginning of June, pray for good weather, that we can all do this and we can all just have this big celebration in the field together. Ephesians chapter 4, though, is where it plays out then into pastors and into the church realm. And it says, And he that is Christ himself gave to some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That Christ placed headship and leadership within the church for a specific purpose. And that is not for me to glory in my authority, not for me to, I'm the head pastor. I'm not that. I didn't want to be that when we formed this church. I was opposed to that because we only have one chief shepherd, and that is Jesus Christ. But rather, I'm an elder, as Steve and, and, and David are elders. I just happen to be the, the primary teaching elder as we come through. But the purpose then of giving these pastors and teachers in these other offices was for the equipping of the saints. I'm, I have a function to come along beside Christ in his headship to the body in order to equip you, the body, to glorify him, the head. First Peter 5, we're told, beginning of verse 1, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am also a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's literally head pastor, you could put it that, bring it that into Greek there and bring it over as head pastor. And when the head pastor or the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, based upon this headship situation, based upon the fact that the elders are supposed to be lovingly leading the flock and that the, the others are supposed to be in submission to the elders, based upon all that, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Do you see the context of that? That has everything to do with us submitting unto one another and having this spiritual hierarchy within the assembly that we're not pushing our own ways within the assembly and, well, we've got to do it this way or we've got to do it that way. I don't, I don't think that one's the right way. I, I don't know if Bob, David, and Steve know what they're doing. Well, you ought to be praying for us to be following after the headship of Christ and not seeking to bring division into the assembly. Do you realize that every time division comes within the church, Satan gets such great glory out of this. People mock the church. People mock Christ. They mock God. God, you know, again, do all to the glory, the reputation of God, right? Well, the sad thing is when we, when we do the heresy thing and we do the division thing, and we bring schisms into the church, we are doing things to the reputation of God, but they're not good things. And so Satan, like the roaring lion, is seeking to devour the church. He wants to divide the church. He does that by getting people to attack the elders, questioning the elders. Now, I'm not saying... Elders should be beyond question. But remember what it says, and, and I don't have time to get into all this, but that if anybody has an accusation against an elder, it ought to be with two or three witnesses. So that there ought to be this desire to, to have um, accountability. But anyone who's trying to push their own way and 
um, seeking to attack an elder in a church, not just this church, but any church, then they're going to give an account to God, is clearly what God's word says. Hebrews 13, ending with this part, says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Them, let them do so with joy, not with grief, for what for what would be for that would be unprofitable to you. And so I want to just challenge you. I mean, this is a hard passage for me to, to teach on because again, this all is going to sound like it's it's self-gloating here. But these concepts are in God's word, and they're there for a reason, because this is a p- place where Satan loves to attack. He has attacked it in the past. He has sought to cause division in the church. He has caused division in the church, and he has caused it by unrighteous leaders, false apostles, ministers of, of Satan who pretend to be ministers of righteousness, but he also does it through people within the assembly who then pretend themselves to be ministers of righteousness, and they attack the true leadership of the church. So I just want to challenge you that, um, that as you then have misgivings about me or David or Steve or the three of us as a grouping, or maybe even the, the elders and, the, and the, the deacons together, to ask yourself, is this really just from your flesh? Is it something that Satan is using to, to bring as a, a destruction between you and the church. There needs to be a commitment between you and the church. There are a lot of people who are on the fringe, not just in this assembly, but in the church as a whole. People are going out to churches only for what they can get out of it, not what they can put into it. But Ephesians 4, if we were to continue in that passage, we see that the whole part of the body is to to play its part, and that the body cannot do what it's designed to do unless everybody plays the part. And so if you are on this Zoom, and you're local, you are supposed to be within this body, not just seeing what you get out of it, but what you can put into it. If that's not your goal, if you don't come saying, what does God want me to bring to this assembly? What part does he want me to play? I promise you, you're living short of of what God desires for you to do within the local assembly. We've got to move on. So from the standard of the ministry, we want to look at the sphere of our ministry, because Paul talks about this word sphere. Now, what's fun about this word um, is it it really isn't um, a sphere, like a rounded object, okay? But literally, it's the word canon. We talk about the canonization of scripture, and the word canon literally means the standard. The standard of measure, something, the standard by which something is measured. And so as Paul then is talking about this sphere that he is ministering, he's talking about the standard of his ministry as well. And so so we know that the standard, and I chose to use a different word because the ultimate standard of the ministry is Christ himself. But then when you come to the specific individual um, and where they're ministering, there is a a particular um, grouping of people to whom that you're going to minister to. Now, this isn't just talking to me, but by application, it's talking to each one of us. You have a, a sphere, a, 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 a group of people to whom you're ministering to. Dads, dads, if you've got kids, the standard, if you would, the canon, the measuring toll, the measuring stick of your ministry is going to be your kids. I said this many, many years ago, the previous um, church that I was at, that the true measure of whether I am uh, 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 to be a minister of God, to be an elder, is going to play out in the next 10 to 15 years. I'm in those years right now. You all should be looking at, and this is no pressure on my kids, especially you guys that are, are tuning in, but my kids are a testimony to whether I have rolled well my house, whether I have taught them of the truth of God's word, whether I brought them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Dads, if we came into your home and we, we talked to your wives, we talked to your kids, what is the canon of your ministry? What is your sphere of ministry like? What if we walked into your workplace and we talked to people about how you act there? What about your neighborhood, how you live, how you act, how you talk? Are you consistent in in your walk? Paul says then, this sphere is going to be broken up into two groupings. First of all, there's the edification of those with whom God has placed us. 
And so we see that beginning of verse eight, for even if I should boast, this word boast, um, um, kalkomai, is, I, I wish I could show you. I mean, I, I'll show you my, my, uh, my paper here. I got it all color coded. But this word kalkomai comes out numerous times all the way from chapter 10 all the way into chapter 13. And we saw it earlier in chapter one and chapter two. If you remember way back then, I talked about how we were going to be getting into this. And here we are. Paul's going to be doing this boasting thing, but he's trying to do it in a balance that he's not boasting of himself, but he's going to be boasting of Christ and what Christ has done through him. And so he says, beginning verse eight, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. So as we saw in Ephesians chapter 4, that Christ put certain people, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, or the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, into specific churches for the edification of the body, for, for us to come and to, to train and to teach and equip the saints, not to destroy, but to lift up. I know that sometimes my teaching um, can be more exhortational than encouraging, more confrontational than comforting. And that bothers me sometimes because I really want to be one who is, is lifting you up and encouraging you and, re, and getting you to rejoice in the relationship that you have in Christ. And yet I know that in these days, we're living in the days when lawlessness is abounding. And Jesus said, because lawlessness would abound, the love of many would wax cold, that we need to be continually prodded and encouraged and, and, and inspired to move forward and not be lax of days ago in our relationship with Christ, not to become content. We get so um, distracted by the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We need to be prodded and encouraged. And so Paul says, look, I'm seeking to encourage you not to destroy you. Verse 9, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that as we are in person by letters when we are absent, such we will be indeed when we are present. Then down to verse 13. We, however, will not boast, Kakomai, beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere, the canon, which God has appointed us, a sphere, metros, a measure. That word is actually like the word we get the word metric or measurements, okay, metros, the, a sphere or a measure, which especially includes you. And so for me, a measure, if you would, sphere of ministry are you. That people should be able to come to you to get a measure of mine and David and Steve's ministries among you. Are you closer to Christ today than you were a year ago? Has the being a part of this assembly had a positive effect in your life? Have you been edified? Have you been pointed to Christ? Are you closer to God today than you were the, than the day you, you came and joined this assembly? That ought to be the goal. That ought to be the thing. The edification of those with whom God has placed you. Secondly, the evangelism of those who need to know him. Because in verse 16 then we read, dropping down to verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast, kachamai, in another man's sphere or canon of accomplishment, but he who glories, Kalkamai, boasts, let him glory, boasts, Kalkamai, in Yahweh. And so now we get into this reference to Jeremiah 20, uh, uh, 29, where we're talking about this glory that we're going to have, but th this glory that we're going to have is going to be based upon the evangelism, evangelization of others who don't know him. So again, Matthew 28, we're told to go and to make disciples. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you remember way back when we talked about this, we're told that we were given by God the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are supposed to be ambassadors of God, and as though God were pleading through us to be reconciled to him. As we then play this out, we then look at this summation of our ministry, which is where I really want to look at here quickly, but, but again in detail. And that is that the summation of my ministry then is going to be my relationship with, with God himself. That when I go out and I begin to evangelize others, 
it's ultimately going to come back to this passage of Jeremiah 29. And that is, let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. In context, beginning then in verse 23, Jeremiah 29, 23, says, thus says Yahweh, let not the wise man, because there are people who are wise, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man, ching, 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 right, glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am Yahweh, exercising chesed, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says Yahweh. Do you know how that, that starts and ends with, says Yahweh? Yahweh wants us to know this important truth. He doesn't want us boasting on ourselves. And that's where Paul is finding this balance. Look, I don't want to be boasting in me. It's not about me. It's all about Christ. And so as I go out and I evangelize others, I don't want to be boasting in another man's work. I want to be boasting about what God is doing through me. What's he doing through you? That's what our testimony time is all about. Not about pointing it to me. We've got to be careful in that. Sometimes in our testimonies, we tend to start pointing things to ourselves. It's not about me. I want to talk about what God is doing through me, what God is doing in me, what God did in somebody else that I was blessed by. Testimonies are testimonies of God, not about ourselves. Next week is Mother's Day. There's a struggle a lot of times, and I'm not saying you can't give a testimony um, about your wife or your mother or whatever, but again, this is a worship service to glorify and worship God and Him alone, and it's to glorify God in what He's done, not to glorify my wife. I tell my wife how thankful I am that she's my wife. I don't need to do that in the church service. She's the second best gift that God has ever given me. Number one, it's God Himself. The relationship that I have with Christ. I'm thankful for Marcia, but that's another story. I don't boast in her. I don't boast in my, my way I love her. In fact, I ought to say otherwise because I have a struggle with that. I want to continue to grow in my ability to love my wife. But I want to boast in what God has done through me. Again, just talking about that relationship with my wife. If you'd have known me 30, 40 years ago, you'd have known we were going to get a divorce. Because this guy was a rude, crude individual who cussed his wife out, wanted to kick her out of the car. That was really me. And those people said, no, no, that could have been you. Yes, yes, it was me. That's who Bob is. But I want to tell you about my God, who's able to change and transform an individual to be able to proclaim his word and his truth, to point people to him. That's the God I want you to know about. Look, it doesn't matter how much scripture I can quote. It doesn't matter about how much wisdom I, I have. It doesn't matter whether I can pour a concrete pad. It doesn't matter whether I know how to build a wall. Those are kind of exciting things that God has revealed to me and how to do certain things. But that has nothing to do with it. It's all about God who, who, who answered my prayer and said, I, where I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, you told me that. I believe it. You put this work in front of me. So now you got to teach me how to do it. And he did. I didn't grow up learning how to do that stuff, but he did it. Because he's true to his word. Because he is the God of chesed. He is the faithful, loving, kind God who is true to his covenants. I wish I was big and bulky and strong and that I could lift things. I wish I was about six inches taller sometimes, you know. But there are people, though, who then, you know, they want to show their, off their bodies and they want to show. I don't want to be that individual. You don't want to see my body. But I don't want to be one of those guys who want everybody to look at him. Say, oh, look at me. I know I struggle with my hair and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but I still try to get over that, past that. I don't want to be that mighty man. I don't want people looking to me in the flesh. I don't want to be trusting in the riches as well. And I praise the Lord for godly men who God has given riches to in order to facilitate the kingdom. But there are individuals who let you know how much they got. They're, they're wanting people to look to them. They're glorying in themselves. 
Yahweh says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Do you know God? Not just know about him, but do you know him? Do you know him in your heart intimately? Like you know the person sitting next to you, that you know them that well. Not like you know Donald Trump. Probably nobody in this audience knows Donald, knows, really knows Donald Trump. You know about Donald Trump. You read a, thing, a lot of things about Donald Trump. You read things from different perspectives of Donald Trump, but you really don't know him. Now, Mike Pence, he might have known about Donald Trump before, but I guarantee you that after these past couple of years, Mike Pence knows Donald Trump a whole lot better than he did before. Do you know God? Not just about God. Do you know him? I promise you that he wants you to know him. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14. I'm not going to go through all that, but Paul says, he talks about all the things that were of himself and how he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, that concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. But he says in the end, he says, but all things I count but dung, that I may know him, that I may know Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. He says, look, I put all these things aside and I'm pressing toward the mark that I may know Christ. Is that your desire? Is that your pursuit? Knowing God surpasses all self-accomplishments, but secondly, knowing God precludes self-boasting. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. I love asking people when we go door to door, Steve and I, and, um, and I then have the gumption to ask a question, but if you should die, do you know where you're going to go today? And then someone says, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven. So I, my next question, following question is going to be, well, if, if you go to heaven and you go before God's throne and God says to you, why shall I allow you into my heaven? What would be your answer? Well, I know many years ago when someone asked me that question, my answer was, well, I go to church every Sunday. My dad's the treasurer. I've been active in the youth group. I even gave one of the uh, devotionals. I even gave one of the homilies at one of the youth services. Did you know what my answer was? It was all about Bob. I was glorying in myself, boasting in my own abilities and my own accomplishments. But Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says it's not by works. It doesn't matter how many doors I knock on. It doesn't matter how many people get saved through me. It doesn't matter how many times I pray. It doesn't matter of any of those other things. It matters on the relationship. It's by God's grace that he has allowed us to come by faith not by our works. Now, verse 10 says that he, he has saved us under good works. So therefore, those who are saved will desire to serve him. But that's not the basis of my salvation at all. Secondly, though, where Paul then gets into this in the, into the rest of 10 and into 11, that's why we read that far, was in the second part here, the summation of my ministry, it's not just going to be summed by my relationship with God, whether I know him, but it's going to be summed up then by my representation of God himself. In Matthew 7, verse 21 to 27, if you have your Bibles, you can, you can turn there and read it, but I'll read it out loud for you here. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. The rain descends, the flood came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and he beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Matthew 25, verse 14, we read, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. 
Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another, made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two had gained two more also. But he who had received only one talent went and dug it in the ground, dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts. So he who had received the five talents came and brought five others as well, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you have delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For ever, to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the end, there is going to be a judgment of your representation. Just as Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in the chapter 11, when he talks about these false apostles, whose end shall be according to their works. We talked about this last week. You can go back and listen to last week's message if you, if you weren't here for that. I don't want to repeat it all. But there are true apostles, true teachers of God's word, and there are false teachers. Jesus said, there are going to be come, some who come to me in that, that day, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do all these wonderful works in your name? And I'm going to say, depart from you, son of lawlessness. I didn't know you. You could have proclaimed to know me. You might have even done all these things for your own self-glory, using my name to bring you glory, but it wasn't for me. You can't fool God. You can fool everybody else, but you cannot fool God. And so in the end, will you receive the commendation of God? Paul says in chapter 10, verse 12, it says, for we do not, dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. I look good compared to everybody else. I mean, I could, I could, I could, I could find some straw men to put myself up against and make myself feel really good about myself. But the ultimate standard is Christ himself. If you are Comparing yourself against other people, it's a wrong standard. It's a false standard. you got to get rid of it. He goes on in verse 18 then, the very end, he says, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Lord, Lord, depart from me, you son of lawlessness. I didn't know you. And then there's the, the one came with the ten talents, and the one with the five talents, the one with the two talents, who invested what they got. The one with two didn't get as much as the one with the 10. He didn't have as much to work with. You may not have as much to work with as somebody else in the church. It doesn't matter. You are responsible to invest what God has given to you. Are you investing in it? Or are you digging a hole in the ground? Will you receive the well done by good and faithful servant when Christ comes back? Or will you receive you wicked and slothful servant? You knew that I reaped where I didn't sow. You knew that I that I I I love to, to to gather where I didn't scatter, and yet you did nothing, nothing with what I gave you. Rather than 
you used it for your, your liberty, for your own occasion, for your own flesh. I think there's going to be a lot of people in that day who are going to be surprised. I pray there's no one listening to this message. That we would judge ourselves, that we be not judged. That we would be true in our walk with Christ. The defense of our ministry is not about what we have accomplished. Paul's going to talk about that a little bit, and we'll look at that next week. But it's what God has accomplished. That is the testimony. That is the standard, the sphere, the summation of our ministry. What has God done in and through me? He is the one who does the work in me. He places it in me to serve him. He places it in you to serve him. What are you doing with it? Do you see yourself as a servant of God? Do you recognize your role as the ambassador of Christ? Who tends to receive the glory when you accomplish something? You or God? What do you talk about more? more? Your accomplishments or God's accomplishments? Do you love to talk about what you've done or do you like to talk about what God has done? Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you desire for us to know you, that you made the way, Lord, that we might know you. Lord, truly everything about our lives, about our ministries, because we are to be your, your servants, your stewards. Everything about the ministry of our lives is about you, Lord, what you have done in our lives. Lord, I pray right now specifically for David and Steve and myself, as well as I pray for the elders and pastors of other churches, Lord. I pray for Pastor Lane over at Westside Baptist, Lord, that you would cause us to have a hunger and thirst for you. Lord, that we would have in our own daily time, time with you, Lord, before your presence, being taught by you, seeking your face, Lord, and that we would be used by you to bring you glory. Lord, I pray for those who are in this assembly. I pray for the men in this assembly. Lord, that they would see themselves as your servants, as ambassadors. Lord, that they would desire to, to be committed to you, Lord, that they would they would invest the talents which you have given them, that they would not sell you short, but they would realize, Lord, how much that you have given to them, and they would desire to, to magnify you with them. Oh, God, forgive us. Forgive us for squandering time. Help us to redeem the time, knowing the days are evil. Oh, Lord, help us not to be those whose love will wax cold because the days are evil. Lord, help us not to be distracted by materialism and the things of this world, but rather, Lord, help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Give us the chutzpah, Lord. Help us to have the backbone. Help us to have the boldness to not proclaim our own goodness, but yours. And may you use this little assembly for your glory throughout the world, Lord, that you would send forth your message and people will be drawn to you because of your desire to use. We who are weak and are nothing, that we might magnify you who are everything. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.